All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Stefano Lonardi. I'm a professor at UC Riverside, which is not too far from here, but much hotter. Um, so you should go there. I uh, shouldn't go there in the summer. <laughs> um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about um, our experience, our research uh, on um, genome assembly. Uh, and the title is a little bit of clickbait, since I heard yesterday there is a competition about YouTube uh, uh, views. So anyway, um, all right, so why are we interested in genome assembly? Um, because we haven't done much. If you think about it, there is a, a lot of species on this planet, um, estimates 10, 10 million eukaryotes, um, and we only sequence a few, maybe a thousand to some degree of, of completion. Um, you probably know about this herd biogenome project. Um, they are planning to sequence 9,000 um, species uh, in different uh, phylogenetic tree, or areas of phylogenetic tree, but it's still going to be very small. So we need something, we need to be able to automate, we need to be able to assemble and uh, sequence and assemble in a very a much more efficient way if we want to capture all the diversity on the planet. Um, it's still very hard to assemble, okay? It's still difficult to assemble genomes, although the sequencing technology has improved dramatically in the last 20 years, um, it's still challenging. Still needs a lot of human intervention. <clears throat> so just for those of you that maybe are not familiar with the sequencing technologies, we have the first generation, which was the Sanger sequencing instruments, developed in the 70s, um, then the second generation, which is the Illumina 454 uh, ABI that disappear, mostly Illumina, right? Uh, the, there is 100 to 300 base pairs. And then we have the third generation on the sequencing instruments, which is PacBio and Oxford Nanopore. Those are longer, but they are uh, more error prone, with the exception of HiFi. Uh, the genomes are still very large, um, right? So it can range up to a few, few gigabases, and so we cannot read these genomes from the beginning to the end. The sequence tree instrument, the technology is now there to read them from the beginning to the end. So we need to do what's called a shotgun approach. We break the genome into pieces, we sequence each piece, and then we assemble them by looking for overlaps. So these fragments are called reads, and probably heard about this term many times. So what is the problem of genome assembly? In input, we're given the reads, right? It could be short reads. Illumina or new technology that is coming out. Uh, it could be a single N, pair N, made pairs, all kinds of uh, uh, short reads. And then uh, possibly long reads, um, and there is several types. And uh, possibly maps, okay? So maps are going to help us understand the relation between these contexts in the genome, orient them, uh, figure out the distance between them. So the maps that are usually available uh, are physical and genetic maps. Um, mostly for plants. Um, optical maps are available for pretty much any, any organism you want. And then uh, sometimes people use high C to capture long distance relations between the context. What we want in the output is the best, right? We want the best assembly. Uh, what does it mean best? It means uh, contiguous. It means that we want the species of the genome is covered as well as possible. Um, and we also don't want to introduce, we don't want errors, okay? Errors are bad. We don't want misjoints. We don't want contexts that are falsely joined, okay? So there are, these are two things that are sort of in opposite to each other, that are contradicting each other because the best way to not make any mistake is not to assemble anything. Right, so if you don't touch the reads and you leave them as they are, then there is no mistakes except for chimeric reads. Um, if you start assembling them, there is a chance that you will make mistakes, right? And the more you assemble, the more aggressive you are in assembling the reads, the more likely you will make a mistake. All right, so um, assembly has two steps. The context generation, when you take the reads and you assemble them by looking at overlaps, and then the scaffolding, okay? The scaffolding is when you look at these contexts here, um, that have been assembled them, and you try to figure out the order between them and the space that is between them, right, if there are gaps. So these gaps are usually um, the result of the fact that the assembler could not assemble these regions. And, and these are the, this, is the, this is the stuff that um, is challenging to do, okay? So again, the goal is to maximize contiguity and, uh, and, and uh, minimize the assembly errors. 
Okay, so why is it challenging? Uh, well, there are technology-dependent reasons. One is that, for example, the sequence coverage is not uniform. There will be regions of the genome which are low coverage, uh, and therefore the assembly is going to be challenging there. Um, there, was, there are sequencing errors. Um, there are reads that are chimeric, right? Reads are chimeric reads are reads in which part of the read comes from one part of the genome and another part comes from a different uh, region of the, the genome. Um, and then there are genome-dependent issues, right? So even if technology was better, um, the genome technology, sorry, the genome itself uh, has challenges, and mostly due to the fact that we have repeats, right? This picture here at the bottom shows the, this is an old picture on BioNano, shows the, the, the repeat, the number of copies of a repeat in different plants. So the y-axis is the number of copies. The, the, the x-axis is the size of the repeat, and so these are tandem repeats. This is the same unit repeated 223, 223 times. Okay, you can imagine how hard it is to assemble those regions. Um, the, the other challenge is the fact sometimes you have more than one copy of a chromosome, right? Like in humans, it's diploid. Um, but there are species which are tetraploid, there are species which are exoploid. Right? So when you have multiple copies of the same genome and you have a small difference between the chromosomes, then it gets really tricky to phase them. Okay. All right, so my adventure in assembly goes back a long time ago. Um, it was the late 90s when we were working on Drosophila. Um, and uh, this is this is what we did with Sanger and, and a physical map, and that was it. Um, uh, so that was first generation sequencing instruments. Uh, and then when I joined UCR after a while, I got involved in sequencing barley, and we did that with Lumina and a physical map and a genetic map. And this was a draft genome, um, but still, the genome is really big. It's 5.3 billion base pairs. So it's, it was challenging. Um, and then we did another version of the barley, <laughs> a better one. Uh, in this case, we also use high C and a bunch of maps, okay, to again help the scaffolding step. Um, the sequencing instruments were pretty much the same. More recently, we sequenced cowpea, which is a very interesting legume um, because it's drought resistant. Uh, so in, in this era of climate change, we are looking for plants that can, be, can feed people uh, with less water. Uh, and this was done with um, the original PAC bio, an optical map and a genetic map. Uh, we also did um, a, a, the potato blight, which is an infectious uh, disease, if you want. It's, it's, a, it's a pathogen. Uh, for uh, potatoes that they can destroy crops. And this was uh, uh, a major, uh, the cause of the famine, in uh, the Irish famine in the 1800s. And then the most recent one was uh, the sequencing of uh, an infectious disease called Babesia dancani, who is an emerging disease. It's transmitted by ticks, a little bit like Lyme disease, but the, um, but the symptoms are more like malaria. And we really don't know much about this infectious disease. We don't know how to treat it. Um, so that was, that was an interesting project. And this was done with HiFi, uh, high C contact maps, and an optical map. So just to give you an idea about the complexity of, um, of running an assembly, a good assembly, so and this is the pipeline we use for Babesia. Uh, we had the contamination step, which is this, uh, uh, this blue step here. Sorry, blue, <laughs> yellow. Um, and then the assembler is I, I canoe, and then we did uh, scaffolding with BioNano, a, a, a polishing step with poly, uh, with, um, poly polish, and then eventually we look at IC. So a lot of tools, a complex pipeline. You need to do quality control at all steps to so make sure that you're not introducing errors. A lot of manual curations, a lot of time. This can take easily a year. All right, so here's the roadmap of my talk. So the first thing I'm going to address is if you had, if tomorrow someone gives you some hi-fi reads, you know, in a collaborator says, here is the hi-fi reads, you want to assemble them, what assembler should you use? Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about assembly conciliation and then how to detect errors in the, in the assemblies and eventually um, um, talking about how to de deal with P repeats or segmental duplications. So there are two papers that I would suggest reading if you're interested in figure, figuring out which is a good assembler for you. There is this paper in Nature in 2022 um, that, that uh, for the, from the Human Pan Genome Research uh, Reference Consortium. Uh, they sequenced uh, humans. This is only for humans. They have generated lots of data, and uh, they did uh, did compare the pipelines for three obey three obeys assemblies. So they sequenced a child and 
the, uh, the two parents and they tried to assemble them together uh, or at least compare them. And they compared all these different assemblers. So canoe, I canoe, cross stitch, falcon, and so on and so forth. What I want to point out is that they, um, they determined that no matter what you use, there are going to be, there is going to be errors, okay? So there is always going to be misjoins, misjoins, uh, inversions, false duplications, all kinds of things, okay? Um, they also compare quality, but I don't have time to go into that. Um, we did also, um, we, we did recently uh, work on a similar type of benchmark scheme, but we also only looked at um, assemblers, uh, uh, standalone assemblers. We compared these nine assemblers for i 5 uh, We generated a synthetic reads for um, different, uh, different genomes with diploidy, sequencing coverage, heterozygous rate. Uh, we also run these nine assemblers on real data, uh, uploid, deployed, and tetraploid. And in fact, this wax apple data set was generated specifically for this paper. And this paper is in bioarchive, so it's not published, it's not peer reviewed, so take it with a grain of salt. We compared a bunch of different, um, we use a bunch of different measures to evaluate the quality of the assembler uh, using Quas, Busco, and all so forth. So who is the winner? Um, so we looked at a bunch of measures, as I said, these are the nine assemblers. Um, I don't have time to go through all the figures, there is a lot. Um, bottom line is that Haikanu and IFI ASP, with the top two here, are probably the best choice. Okay, with Haikanu, probably even better. Sorry, HiFi ASP, even better. Haikanu is a second. We also look at completion, for example, Basco completion, uh, and many other measures, okay? So before you jump into your assembly project, maybe you could look at this paper and try to figure out what assembly you should use based on the number of chromosomes, the number of copies of each chromosome, the, the size of the genome, the repetitive content, and so on and so forth. So benchmarks are useful, um, but they are very limited, right? So in this case, we tested on three plants. What if you're using this on something completely different, a much smaller genome or a much bigger genome? Would that be still the best assembler? Um, so there is really no assembly method that is the best, okay? There is always compromises. So in early 2000, I was looking at um, if there is any other way we can approach this, right? So we have all these tools, with these wonderful tools, um, and, and, and in some sense we, have, we are asked to choose one for the whole genome. But, but may, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we, sh we could take all of them. Maybe we could take all these, these assemblers, right, and generate K assemblies, and then try to merge them, and try to best, you know, get the best of all of them, okay? Is this possible? Um, see, this problem is called assembly reconciliation, and there were a bunch of tools at that time that claimed that it would allow you to do this, take an input, maybe two, two assemblies, and get an, an output, an assembly, which is better than the input assemblers. And uh, so we did this, we tested this, another benchmarking paper, we tested this on these assemblers, um, these assemblies, uh, we sem so, so these we use Chisa, Ga, Gam, uh, GRM, MetaAssembler, Mix, and Zorro on these assemblies and tested with whether the output of the assembly was better than the two inputs. So we, we plotted these, um, these results in this, in this two-dimensional uh, space where the x-axis is the quality of the, the contiguity. So higher is better. And uh, the y-axis is the number of uh, misassemblies. In this case, higher is worse. So if you have two input assemblies, two different assemblers, you give you two different assemblies, and, and then you run them through this assembly reconciliation, what you would like to see, you would like to see the output to be um, lower than the lowest of the two and to the right of the right of most of the two, right? So because in that case, you have higher quality overall in terms of number of uh, misassemblies and contiguity. So we did this uh, in a paper that appeared in genome biology, and uh, it turns out that none of these methods, not a single one, can okay, uh, actually improve the quality of the assembly. Okay? And I made lots of enemies probably with doing this, but that's okay. Um, I'm not going to show you all the pictures, but again, there was only one case, which is, oh, sorry, which was this one here, where the assembly was actually better. So here, in input is one and two, right? One and two, one and two, and then in output are all the assemblies produced by the meta, these, these meta-assemblers or genome reconciliation 
assembly methods. Um, so there was only one case out of dozens in which the merged assembly was better than the two input assemblies. Too bad. So, but still the problem is, is very interesting and we were interested in, in trying to figure out if we could do something about this. Um, and so we thought maybe we can take, maybe we could have additional information that would allow us to merge assemblies. Okay, so if you, instead of, uh, uh, instead of relying only on the sequence, maybe there's something we can do to merge them. And so this idea of using opti optical maps came out. So an optical map is a map where uh, DNA is stretched and passed through these nanochannels. Um, and uh, then a nicken enzyme is used, which is attached to the fluorophore. And then while the DNA is going through these nanochannels, we look at the distance between these nicking enzyme sites, right? So, so you, you, we're using a specific nicking enzyme. It's like a restriction enzyme site, um, but they bring with them a fluorophore. So you can get the distance between two adjacent restriction enzyme sites if you want, right? If you know restriction enzyme mapping in the old days, um, this is almost the same. The difference is that here you get not just the distance, but also the order of these distances, okay? So you will get, a, 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 for every piece of DNA, you will get a vector of numbers, 273, 77, 81, 351, that's it. That's the optical map, okay? The, the beautiful thing about an optic, optical map is that you can, you can um, take your assembly, check for the restriction enzyme sites, and then map the assembly against the optical map, and you can see, look at the alignment. So what we thought about doing is maybe we could take the optical map and use that as a reference, as, as the, the, um, the anchor, if you want, and take all these assemblies generated by multiple assemblers and map them against the optical map so that you could actually merge them. So this is what we did in uh, 2016, 2017, while we were sequencing cowpea. We generated multiple assemblies with different assemblers these days, I would use iFi, obviously, but this is what done with, with CLR, with the uh, old, old PacBio stuff. Um, we, done, we, we, did run, we did run uh, Canoo, for example, with different parameters. And an interesting thing is that if you run Canoo with different parameters, you will get different assemblies. You will get different assemblies. Um, some of the stuff will be in common, but there will be differences, okay, just by changing the parameters. So we did run, uh, we had these uh, assemblies produced by Canoe, Ebrugine, Falcon, and so on and so forth. And then we run them through the optical map. So we align them to the optical map, like here. So the optical map molecule is in green. The assemblies are in blue. And the first thing we did was uh, detect whether we had mis misjoints. Okay, so in this case, you can see there is a wonderful alignment here. And then there is a spot here where the optical map says, oh, you have a bunch of repeats here, and you had the misassembly. Okay, so we had to cut here the assembly and cut here the assembly before we did anything else. So we have a tool actually that does this automatically. You provide one or more optical maps and, uh, and your assemblies and it will find these chimeric positions and cut them for you. It's in bioinformatics. Uh, once we did the detection of chimeric context, we align all the assemblies, all the assembly, so, so we had eight assemblies against the optical map. And something very interesting came out, the fact that, observe that, so for example, some of these, uh, you don't get the same assembly, okay? So maybe one of these is Canoe, the other one is Falcon, the other one is iFly, whatever is the assembler, they cover this optical map in different ways. So, so, so assemblers have strengths and weaknesses. Some of them cover regions that other assemblers don't. But it's not always the case that the same assembler is the best everywhere. So, it makes sense to make local decisions and just say, well, for this optical molecule, for just this optical molecule, for this region of the genome, which is six million base pairs long, I'm going to pick this contic and that contic and, and merge them, not the other ones. Maybe it's going to be canoe for this region. Maybe for a different region, it's going to be uh, Falcon, right? Or something else, or ifi asp okay? And it's very powerful, it's very useful. Uh, and allows you to leverage the, the, the strengths of all the, of all the assemblers instead of just picking one for the whole genome. So um, once, you, once you align them, you find the minimum tiling path, which in this case are these two longest, the two longest contacts that span the whole region, and then you merge them, you, we stitch them. 
We stitch them together and we get these wonderful 20 million base pairs long contig. Okay. Um, so this is a pipeline called Novo and Stitch to make fun of Lilo and Stitch at Walt Disney. So and so we it's an iterative um, it's an iterative process where we take the input contigs, we align them at the optical map, we find the uh, the uh, chimeric context, the MTP, and then we iterate this process until there is nothing left to be stitched. Okay. So this work was um, in uh, proceedings of SMB and in bioinformatics in 2018. Um, so we also showed that this actually helps, <laughs> obviously. Um, so the, the N50, for example, this is the original N50, uh, was about 4.8 million base pairs. After you stitch them, you get about twice as much, twice as long. Um, and the, we proved, we showed that the number of misassemblies was uh, also not increased. The last, um, the last topic I want to talk about is something that we recently finished and published, uh, sh should appear in uh, proceedings of BCB. And if you, came, if you were yesterday here in this, in this room, uh, this idea is very similar to another paper that is coming out in genome biology. Too bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's very interesting that we got the same idea. But um, so, what is the problem? Um, the problem is we have um, we have we have tandem repeats in the genome, a lot of them, um, and so so a tandem repeat is uh, uh, is a unit like this alpha string that is repeated a bunch of times. Right? It could be ten times to. 50 times to 100 times. Um, and a typical assembler will only give you one copy, okay? Because, uh, because all the reads are so similar to each other that the, the repeat is over collapsed, right? You get one copy, maybe two. What we want is to reconstruct. We want to figure out all the copies. We want to figure out how many copies we have, uh, but we want to see the content of these, these repetitive regions. Um, so again, um, the first thing we do is uh, we take all the reads, the HiFi reads, we map them, um, we map them against um, the um, a draft genome, and uh, um, uh, it, because the draft genome has a, a collapse repeat, we are going to observe this uh, this bump in the coverage. Right. So the bump in coverage will tell us that this region has a collapse repeat. So the height of these. Um, the height of the bump also will tell us approximately how many copies we have. Right? So if the average sequencing coverage is 10x and the bump is at 100x, then we we'll probably have 10 copies. Okay. Oh, I should mention that um, the assumption of all this work is that each copy of these alpha has small differences. They are not identical to each other because if they were identical to each other, there is nothing you can do unless you have a read that spans the whole region. Right? You will not be able to distinguish them. So we're assuming that there are small differences between alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, just a few snips, if you want, a few small changes. All right, so step one, we identify where the, we take a drafted genome, right? So you run your HiFi ASM or ICANU on your HiFi reads. You map the reads back. You say, okay, from here to here, there is a bump in sequencing coverage. That's probably a repeat. Let's focus on that region, okay? So we map the reads in, around this region, we select them, right? We, we take only the red reads, so we also want a little bit of regions around the repeat, uh, sort of a flanking regions, and then we, we only work on that local uh, assembly. So here is an example of a repeat in uh, Rabidopsis thaliana. This is chromosome five, and the average coverage is, I don't know, something like uh, 20. Uh, and then it bumps to over 2,000, right? So the, the height of this will tell you that there is, in this case, is a known tandem repeat, 45,000 repeats, and the unit is 4.5 kilobase, okay? All right. Um, okay, so this is how we identify the regions that need to, we need to work on. Uh, and then we are using this concept called unique mirror um, that was proposed initially in this paper in Nature in 2021 for chromosome eight. Uh, so the idea is to use a camer to look at camers that appear only once in the genome and use those to distinguish the copies, right? So as I said, the copies are not identical. So we need to something to distinguish them and uh, we're using camers, okay? So we're looking for camers that have a single copy camers that have only one occurrence in the genome. 
How do you find them? Well, you find cameras that appear a number of times equal to the average coverage in your read. So something that appears, says, says that your sequencing coverage, average sequencing coverage is 40x. So if you find a camera that appears 40 times in your hi-fi reads, plus or minus something, then it's likely that that camera is a single copy camera in the genome. So, um, so we do this, we, took, we take cameras that appears a number of times, mu minus T sigma, mu plus T sigma, where mu is the sequencing coverage and sigma is a standard deviation for appropriate choices of T. And we, we made sure that, um, that we're doing the right thing, that by doing this, we find the true uniqueness. And so we had a simulation showing that if you pick cameras in the, in the range, mu, uh, three sigma plus three, negative three sigma plus three sigma, around the mean, you get, you get a good number of true positive and, 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 uh, and true negatives. Okay. Um, all right, so, so the, that's what the first thing we do. We, we, we select the reads, we find the unique MERS, and then, um, so by looking at the sequence coverage, we can figure out unique MERS, and then from the unique MERS, we, uh, we, we take the unique MERS and map them against the high fi reads to barcode them. Right, because we want to figure out which reads belong to which copy. So if you have two reads that share the same barcodes, then they're likely to be in the same copy. Okay? So we look at where the unique MERS are, we look at the distance between them, and we make sure that when we put two, two reads in the same cluster in the next step, only if they share enough unique MERS and also the relative distance between them is conserved. <coughs> So in, in step four, we cluster the reads into clusters. And again, we put reads in the same cluster if they share the same unique MERS. Um, and then the idea is, like you saw yesterday, uh, to, to, uh, to assemble these clusters in one by one. Right? So we take these, the reads in each cluster and assemble them through, through a, a regular IFI assembler. Okay? So and that's, it. And, that's, and that's how we get local assembly. So each, each, of, each of these clusters is supposed to give you one copy of the, uh, of the unit. All right, so we, we assemble them. Then we look at overlaps because we need to assemble all the, the context. So the FI assemblers will give you context. Uh, we, uh, we compute overlaps between the context. We build an overlap graph. And then we try to find the consensus. OK, we're trying to find assembly. So we need to resolve cycles. And then we need to find the, uh, a good assembly that traverses the graph. All right, so this is called Rambler, uh, and the pipeline is uh, represented here. Again, you start from the reads, um, you, you estimate the length, the number of copies, um, you identify the unique, unique MERS, then you cluster them, then, uh, then you assemble each cluster independently, uh, then you find the overlap graph, and then you find assembly. Uh, so we tested this on synthetic data, and it seems to be working better than IFI ASM, ICANU, and VERCO on that subset of the reads. Right? So again, this is a local assembly. Only the reads that span the region of the, sem of the, uh, sorry, the repetitive region, plus or minus a little bit of uh, um, uh, um, upstream and downstream um, sequence. Um, and, and we also tried on, on synthetic data, sorry, on real data. Uh, so these are three repetitive regions of chromosome 5 in the Rabidopsis italiana. And again, there are three, three clear bumps here of sequencing coverage. Um, so we, we try to reconstruct uh, the number of the, these repeats. So the expected repeats, for example, in chromosome 5 is 45 copies. And we got 44, while life as um, didn't get any. Um, and Averco, in some cases, doesn't even finish. And so this is... Uh, it seems to be working. We're still, we're still, we're still testing it on more, on more, uh, on more uh, species, but it seems to be working well. All right, so um, I'm actually done. Um, <laughs> so how do you get the best assembly out of your reads? Um, first, you need to choose a good assembler, and may maybe you don't need to choose one, right? So I, I show you how you could take advantage of maybe more than one assembler. You could run your IFI reads on multiple assemblers, uh, and then try to, if you have an optical map, you might be able to stitch them, okay? If you don't have an optical map, then I showed you that we have this paper in, uh, in the genome biology that sequence-based assembly reconciliation is 
not working. Okay, it, you, I wouldn't trust it. But if you have an optical map, um, then you can use the optical map to identify chimeric context. Uh, you can use the optical map to merge multiple assemblies. Uh, you can use the optical map to scaffold the assemblies, obviously. You can even use the optical map to figure out how much of your genome, how much of your genome is missing, right? Because sometimes you have this long molecule and you cover only half of it, and then you know that half of that molecule is missing from your assembly, okay? Um, how do you deal with repetitive regions? We have now two tools, phase tensor presented yesterday. In, uh, it's going to appear in genome biology. Our tool, Rambler, um, in, uh, in BCB, and uh, you can try them out and see if they are, it's going to help resolve, resolving the repeats. The hard reality, though, is that um, at the end, you will always uh, wonder, is my assembly any good? <laughs> because you don't know, right? I mean, if this is in your species, you have no idea. Is it good? Is it, is it accurate? Is it complete? How much of the genome is missing? So that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say. I want to thank my graduate students who did all the work. I just, I'm just suggesting ideas sometimes, but sometimes uh, uh, they, they do that by themselves. Um, so Wei Hua, Hind, Amid, and Shakur, uh, and then my wonderful collaborators uh, at UCR and elsewhere. And so these are the papers I discussed today. Um, and so that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.